this cartoon says, here's the tree, the, the tree calling the apple bad. Lindy Anglin is, is the woman you saw uh, with the, uh, with the lease, uh, leash. Uh, she had a 21st birthday uh, in that, that prison. I frame the question differently. If you ask who is responsible, the only answer appropriate is people. If you say what is responsible, it could be, the answer could be people, but it also could be the situation. Uh, and as John has pointed out, that's obviously the bias that I'm going to present today. Um, so how, does, how do you begin to study this kind of thing? If this is our case example, well, there's three, three approaches. The first is the most traditional. It's called the dispositional. We want to find out what is in those people. Uh, and this is what psychology is all about. This is what medicine is all about. This is what your law is all about. Uh, this is what religion is all about. It's the focus on the individual as culpable of sin, the individual as guilty or innocent, the individual as sane or crazy. And so most of our institutions are, are, are founded on the focus of good and evil in various, however you want to say, inside of people. So in this case, we're going to say, the, the, let's, we're going to analyze these people for a sadistic personality, for path, uh, various kinds of personal pathology. Social psychologists like me come along and say, that might be true, but people always behave in a situation. There's no person, whenever you look at behavior, you only take the picture, there's certainly always a background. And then we say, maybe these are good men and women, good soldiers, who are corrupted by the behavioral context. Uh, that is, by powerful situational forces. So it's not simply looking at the bad apples. It says, we got to know about the barrel. Okay? The third way that I, I said earlier that psychologists have not dealt with, except psychologists study family, uh, family psychologists, is a systems analysis. The system analysis is the step above the situation. It's trying to understand what is the historical, cultural, legal, economic context uh, that creates the situation, that maintains the situation, typically legally, and we'll see when, at the end of the talk, I'm going to get to the Military Commissions Act and the torture memos that made that stuff possible. And that I call the bad barrel makers. In this case, you put a bad barrel of prison in a worse barrel of war, and this is what you're going to get when you don't have military discipline from top down. And as I said, there was never a senior officer in three months who ever went down to that dungeon for a lot of obvious reasons. Most of you probably like me as kids were fascinated with Robert Louis Stevenson's tale of the good Dr. Jekyll drinking some magical elixir and turning into the evil uh, Mr. Hyde. He did this in part, he was his own subject obviously an experiment, he didn't have to go through human subjects committees uh, so he could do whatever he wanted and then the thing is when the, when the elixir wore off he became the good Dr. Jekyll again. And he kept doing it because he was interested in personal experimentation. Uh, but I always wondered as a kid, what was in that chemical? And did you really need it? So he's never going to give up the secret. Do you really need it? So what I'm going to do today is say social psychology research maybe answers questions about that transformation because that's what we're interested in. Can you do it without drugs? And secondly, maybe we could get a twofer. That is, maybe not only answer that, but we also answer how once good army uh, reservists. They were not real soldiers. They're weekend soldiers. The Army Reserve had no training for that job, no training for, to run a prison in a combat zone. And what they were doing is playing a role. That's not who they are. It's a role they play identical to the role my students played in the Stanford Prison Study, identical to the role many of you play as a teacher, as a parent, a as a student. That's not who you are. It's a role you play. The problem is if you play it long enough or deep enough, you think it's you. In a far off land, in this prison, in a controversial, some people say parent, immoral war, who were transformed into perpetrators of evil. Let's see how. Ye old good Stanley Milgram experiment back in 1963. Uh, most people have seen the movie and have not read the story, uh, and most people have it wrong, especially in most textbooks. Uh, because he did it at Yale, and they say, uh, the study he did with Yale students, no students. No high school students, no college students. Not a single student was in that study. In fact, he ran a thousand ordinary people, 
500 from New Haven, 500 from Bridgeport, Connecticut. And who are these ordinary people? The first thing is, he asked the question, would you electrocute a stranger if Hitler asked you to? He's a little Jewish kid from the Bronx, concerned then about the Holocaust. Could it happen again? Of course not. That was Nazi Germany, 1939. We're Americans. We can never do that. He said, well, suppose Hitler or his representatives or somebody in authority said, shock this person. Shock him until he's unconscious or maybe worse. No way. <laughs> it's not going to happen. He said, well, let's see. Let's see. So, he, so he, this ad appeared in the New Haven Register on a Sunday morning. You read it. He begins, the first 500 were all men. Later on, he added women. So in this study, he says, uh, we need people for study of memory. The critical thing is you look at who he says. No special training, no education experience. We want factory workers, city workers, bus drivers, accountants, secretaries, ordinary people. A thousand. So it's the most the study with the most generalized ability in all of psychology, I think all of social science. Nobody's ever had a sample this big with this diversity. And so you come to the lab, partly because it's at Yale, partly because four bucks was okay in 1963, maybe out of curiosity. And when you come to the lab, he says, we want to help people improve their memory. So that's the big lie. That's like national security. It's the big lie. It's a big lie. Once you buy that, then all the means to get there are going to be, you're not going to question. So he says, we know that if you reward uh, the right behavior, people will learn. That's what B.F. Skinner taught us. But nobody's done a study of what happens when you judiciously punish errors. That's what we're all about. We want you to reward this guy when he makes a mistake, or when he gets it right, we want you to punish him when he makes a mistake. And he said, I don't care who's teacher or, or learner, he draws straws. So he's the teacher, he's going to be the learner. So now, we start with ideology, and now we start with giving you respectable roles, teacher and student. And you know what that means. You give him a, you give him material to learn when he gets it right. Uh, you, you tell him good when he gets it wrong. Uh, you punish him. We hook the learner up to an electric chair. We put him in another room. He's a sweet, middle-aged guy, a nice guy, really friendly, like somebody's uncle. Uh, and then you sit down before this imposing shock box. The experimenter is in the lab coat. By the way, it's gray, not white. And everybody says the white lab. And Milgram says explicitly in a footnote, I did want it to be confused with, with the medical research. This expert, this authority, who's going to control this guy, is, was a high school biology teacher. And he's going to get 1,000 of these people doing horrendous things. So essentially, you're sitting before this thing. You start, the guy gets it right, good, good. He starts dumbing down, and you have to shock him. The first shock is 15 volts. Nothing. He, he doesn't even respond. And then you, each, incre each successive increase is 30 volts, 15, 45. No response. Until you get up to 100, the guy starts saying, hey, wait a minute. I didn't think it was going to be this bad. And then it gets more, and the guy starts screaming. And you are a good person. You're a good New Haven citizen. Uh, you're a father. You're you know, later your mother. And you turn to the experiment and say, hey, who will be responsible if something happens to this guy? The person says, I'll be responsible. Continue. So here's now the ideology the, the authority figure in the lab coat, uh, the, the roles that you're given to play. Uh, you got, you're supposedly helping somebody learn. And what we just added was diffusion of responsibility. That's one of the keys in the path to evil. Good. So he's going to be... And now it goes. He's shocking more and more. The guy's not get, getting anything right. And he's screaming. I got a heart condition. I refuse to go on. And you say, I'm not going to go on. Uh, I'm a good person. Uh, I, I can't see somebody suffer. He goes, I'm sorry. You have a contract. You sign a contract. In order to get your four dollars, you have to continue. And so you go on a little more, and now it gets up to 300 degrees. The guy, 300 volts, he's screaming. And it gets up to 300 and, I guess, 75. Um, so he, this is the, the box. And when it gets all the way up to 375, the machine says, danger, severe, shock. And the, the ultimate is 450, triple X, the pornography of power. Who would go all the way? 